Hey everyone, thanks so much for this. You're all a massive bunch of legends. What can I say? What can I say? Lately I've been living like I can't take a loss. They wanna help me, that's what made me a boss. What are my thoughts on the Polynesians making it to the Americas? So, as far as I'm aware, there have been three genetic studies carried out on Polynesians to address this question. One came back inconclusive, two came back positive that Polynesians and Native Americans had contact and the largest of all of those three genetic surveys was one of the ones that came back positive. I'm not a geneticist, I'm sure there's plenty of room for change, but it seems to me that the case is settled that the Polynesians and Native Americans had contact. Is it possible that Native Americans were already on some of the far eastern Polynesian islands? Absolutely, and some people believe that, and I can't say that it's not true. If I was to bet my savings, though, on whether the Native Americans were in Polynesia or the Polynesians made it to the Americas, my money would be on the Polynesians making it to the Americas. It's something like 4,000 kilometers between Polynesia and the coast of South America. That's a really long way to sail, man. That's a really long way to sail. Polynesians could do that, no problem. They could sail that far, because Easter Island, Rapa Nui, is 3,500 kilometers from its closest inhabited island. So we know that the Polynesians can sail that far. We don't have evidence of anyone in South America having a maritime tradition like that. They did produce boats, of course. They sailed up and down the coast. But if the scenario, if the hypothetical scenario is that one of these boats got blown out to sea and drifted 4,000 kilometers, that's a long time to be out at sea. That's a long time to be just bobbing along. It's entirely possible. I'm not saying it's not true. But if I was to bet, I would bet that the Polynesians made it to the Americas. If I could visit any historical event, big or small, what would it be and why? Uh, well, first I want to say I'm not going anywhere unless I can take um, penicillin and opioid painkillers. Because you just know, first day in history, you're going to scratch your arm or you're going to get shot with a musket and they're gonna saw your leg off or you're gonna get an infection which is easily cured in our time but in the 15th century it's just absolutely deadly so if I can't take those two things I'm not going anywhere but I don't know I mean there's so much I would love to see in the world you could go back in time to see what life was really like in the Neolithic how people really lived in the Paleolithic and and it would be so interesting to see if our ideas were anything close to the truth. I'm sure we would be amazed at what they are up to. But maybe it wouldn't be that exciting, you know, living in these small rural communities after a little bit. So maybe somewhere like medieval China, somewhere where there's really stuff going on would be crazy. Like uh, Tenochtitlan at the height of the Aztec Empire. Big, vibrant city full of stuff to do, full of stuff to eat. With all these recent changes in the hominin evolution paradigm, plus the DNA results from Cima de los Huesos, how do we now view the contribution of Homo heidelbergensis and Homo antecessor to the emergence of Homo sapiens? That's a great question from John there. For those who aren't in the know, Homo heidelbergensis for a long time has been thought of as the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Although some did suspect some features on it meant that it was probably a proto-Neanderthal, uh, those people turned out to be correct, at least according to DNA results from Cima de los Huesos in Spain, Homo heidelbergensis, at least that group of them, was on the Neanderthal family tree. Where this leaves their role in the evolution of us, Homo sapiens, that's really hard to say. I mean, that group is now excluded. And uh, at least according to the source over here, poop, or over here, boop, which is a recent source, one that I've been reading, thinking about uh, researching a video on the evolution of Homo sapiens, they are arguing that at the minute, uh, it's impossible to identify an early middle Pleistocene fossils as definitely representing the common ancestral population for H sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, but it is possible to identify groups that are unnamely not. So really, it's in a process of exclusion at the minute. Asian Homo erectus, probably not our direct ancestor. Uh, this group from 
Suma de los Huesos, not our direct ancestor. Uh, as for who was, we don't know. We don't know. And they're actually arguing in here that we need to uh, expand the geographical scope, maybe uh, to outside of Africa, regions adjacent to Africa, like the Middle East and India, to try and figure out this muddle in the middle that it's called. We know that Homo sapiens emerged from Africa like 300,000 years plus. Uh, there's a lot of fossil evidence for the earliest Homo sapiens and, and genetic evidence points to our origins in Africa. But where we were, where our immediate ancestors were before 300,000 years ago, we don't know. We don't know. Hey, Atunche Films. It's me, uh, Stefan. Yes, yeah. yes, you've reached Atunche Films. Who, to whom am I speaking? It's uh, Stefan, your best friend, who? who you always answer the phone to. Who? Stefan. I'm sorry, I don't know anyone by that name. <laughs> they they want to know if I'm going to be on the Witchfinder General. Uh, no, that, that, I'm sorry, that was, that was a one-time thing, Stefan. I'm sorry, but uh, no, no. Uh, no, frankly, your appearance in the last video was a fucking disaster. Everybody hated you. It was it was just the worst. This I'm, is I've really I've got to, I've got to think about myself here, stuff. My my own business. The Witchfinder General, he's a money maker. He's a money maker. I can't let anybody get in the way of that. I'm sure you understand. It's true. He he does the same view as he pretends like we don't know each other and that we're not best friends. And uh, that it, it, it's a bit. It's a bit. Okay. It's just a bit. This isn't a bit. Now, this is a great question. How concerned are you about bad archaeology on YouTube or people who use bad archaeology to justify a larger bad narrative? Like if people used Indo-European studies to push far-right narratives about ancient Aryans. That's a great question, man. That's a great question. It's sad how much, like, terrible far-right archaeology is, is literally being... Uh, pushed on YouTube and gets views in the tens of thousands and it is it is concerning my Strategy at the minute my tactic is to not really engage with that or at least extremely selectively engage with that because The thing is with debunking videos first of all you kind of can come across as a bit of a negative Nancy because you're always saying no 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 and I love prehistory. I love ancient history I don't want to be the guy who's always in a position of saying no I want to share my interests in these ancient civilizations. Um, and also, like, say I debunk something, say I'm like, oh, no, the Vikings didn't make it to South America at 1000 AD or whatever. Well, I still haven't said anything about the evidence for civilization in the Americas at that time. So I think it's more effective rather than being like a debunking guy saying, no, 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 this and that. Provide the information, provide the sources. That's what people are missing. That's what people don't have, don't have access to. And I, it's the same with like uh, the Kennewick man. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions because the original guy looking at it was like, oh, it's a Caucasian guy. And obviously it turns out not to be true. The, you know, genetic studies have confirmed that he's a relative of Native Americans. But instead of making a video debunking about the Kennewick man, make the video about life in America 9,000 years ago. That would be more valuable, in my opinion. And then just selectively, selectively shit all over people and their stupid ideas. <laughs> but you're right, that's a great question, man. It's very concerning, it's very concerning. I don't know, let me know your thoughts on my strategy, but that's my strategy at the minute. That's what I think would be the most effective at countering far right extremist narratives in archaeology. Which brings me neatly onto how I select my video topics. So, I have a really convoluted process when it comes to selecting my video topics. Basically, I'm always reading about archaeology. I follow hundreds of archaeologists on Twitter, and I'm always uh, keeping an eye out for new discoveries. And when something piques my interest, I save it in a folder, and with roughly describes the topic or maybe like a rough idea of a video I could have involving this paper and then over months 
I keep an eye out for other ideas too. So let me give you an example. The other week I heard of a, a find in the east of America, a piece of obsidian that was dated to 9,000 years old, deposited in a layer that was 9,000 years old and had come all the way from Oregon, 4,000 kilometers. And I thought, holy bibbidi boos. That's a long way for a piece of obsidian to travel. I wonder if people expect that in prehistory people had trade networks that extended 4,000 kilometers. That seems interesting to me, seems novel. And then I start thinking, oh, well, what else can I uh, learn about humans in North America 9,000 years ago? And then I saw, oh, that's when the Kennewick man was alive. Very famous and controversial uh, human remains here in America. And I thought, huh, that's an interesting thing that happened 9,000 years ago too. So there's two interesting things that happened in North America 9,000 years ago. You can see the idea forming of a video there. And so now I'm just keeping my eye out for any papers and research and books about that time period in America. And when I think I've got a good list, then I'll really start writing a video for it and so I'm thinking of artwork and all of that and slowly over several months these videos start to take shape. One thing I find is that when I t kind of go through phases, like at the minute I'm in a big human evolution phase because you guys really like the videos so that does stick in my head. Um, you know, the dollar signs start rolling in my eyeballs when I think of a good human evolution topic. Um, but also as you read more about a topic, different video ideas come to mind. And so I sort of go through these phases where at the minute I'm working on a few videos about human evolution, uh, human admixture, all the different shagging between the different species and what does that mean for our definition of human is script is basically done for that. Um, we've got another video i'm not quite sure but i might i might just break down the whole human evolutionary tree and just so, so people get an idea of of where everything sits and their their relationships and some interesting facts all of that sort of sprang off the back of the homo erectus video because i'm reading a lot about human evolution but I, I get bored talking about the same thing over and over again so at some point the wheels are the wheels will shift and the thing will shift and i'll be that I already can tell the next phase is talking about the Americas. I just interviewed a, a professor yesterday about a Mesoamerican civilization. Uh, I'm going to pick up a library book today on the Kennewick man. I've been reading about the Aztecs, lots of crazy stuff going on with the Aztecs, the Nazca. So I feel the wheels are shifting towards the Americas. I don't know, bro. I like your videos, but I wonder, how are you? Are things going fine for you? I bet they are. Yeah, they're going... I honestly can't complain, really. I've got a nice house, beautiful wife, beautiful daughter. I'm pursuing the career of my dreams. Everyone has aspects of their life that they find hard or challenging or complain about. For me, I'm endlessly frustrated at my ability to procrastinate. God, I do love me some procrastination. Like, I literally have to delete the apps from my phone. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, I delete them all from my phone Monday to Friday. And I only reinstall them on Friday. Just to try and get some work done. Because otherwise, I'll just waste waste the day away. And it's a big source of frustration. It's, it's increasingly frustrating when your livelihood is entirely dependent on your like creative output. It's very frustrating. But otherwise, that's, that's a small complaint. I'm doing good, man. Thanks for asking. This ties in perfectly to what's my guilty pleasure. It's pimple popping videos. I could watch those for hours, man. That's what I'm doing when I'm not doing my work. Like if you're wondering, oh, why hasn't Stefan uploaded a video recently? It's because I just watched some absolute massacre of a pimple popping video that and picking my nose. There are seven plus billion people on the planet and not a single one of them picks their nose more than I do. It's not possible. What are my favorite music slash bands? I have a pretty varied music taste. The only thing I can honestly say I don't listen to is uh, metal. Uh, I just prefer chiller vibes to that. That's kind of a harsh vibe for me. But 
in those rare moments when I do need to get pumped up, I might throw some on. But realistically, nine times out of ten, I prefer chiller vibes. Song that I've been blasting at the minute is Feel Good by Marabou State featuring Quang Bin. And I was thinking for this question, why is this an absolute banger? And for me, I think it boils down to this. It's got an electro beat, not too much, just a little bit, electro remix style. It's got a funky beat, funky as hell. It's got a woman singing, and I can't quite make out what she's singing. And then a little bit of cowbell, never hurt anybody. Now, this is not the only type of music I listen to, but if it has those, like, four components... I'm probably going to think it's an absolute banger, realistically. Those, uh, those, there are so many songs that have those four key ingredients that I absolutely love. Have you read about the 210,000-year-old skull of Homo sapiens found in Greece? If this is true, one of your most watched videos, Neanderthals the First Sailors, is wrong. Uh, yeah, I've heard of it from Apodema Cave. I believe I mentioned it in one of my videos. And, um... I, I believe there's every possibility that it is a homo sapien. You know, all these things like Africa, Asia, Europe, these boundaries only exist in our mind. Hominins, 200,000 years ago, were just trying to exploit the evolutionary niches that they could fill, the ecological niches that they could fill, be successful, eat food, make some babies, stuff like that. So they didn't care whether they were in Africa or the Middle East or, or Europe. Um, but at that time they could have walked to Greece, so I don't think it's evidence for water travel. Um, that being said, in that first video, Neanderthals the First Sailors, I did speculate also that Homo erectus could travel across water, and that is still the probably the earliest um, evidence of hominins deliberately traveling. And that's from Asia over to Luzon. How's the redecorating going? It's going good, man. So for those that don't know, probably a bit echoey in here, but uh, for those that don't know, every month I do a live stream with my Patreon supporters where we talk about the latest videos, archeology, span stuff like that. It's really chill, casual Q and A kind of format. This month I couldn't do it because I'm redecorating my office. I've painted it white, still a bunch of stuff in boxes. I uh, have this big like soundproofing mat and I just hung some hooks on the wall for that. It comes with these things. I used to have it on this back wall here. It comes with these things, but if you use the ones they give you, you can't take it off. It's up all the time. And that was something that really bugged me about my last setup. So I've ditched the ones that they give you put some hooks up and now I can just hang the soundproofing when I'm recording so it's not super echoey like it is now with all these bare walls painted it white and I'm trying to have two filming locations so this side of the room with my desk and bookshelf is going to be one filming angle and then this big blank wall is going to be another filming angle maybe I'll put a futon there to sit on because I also need this office to double as a spare bedroom for when people visit. Lucy, that's going to be your futon. What else? What else? I need to find a good way. So I have a lot of stuff from ancientcraft.co.uk like this replica Bronze Age spear from Britain which is obviously super dope. Mesolithic axe, Neolithic, uh, axe, Mesolithic arrow, Neolithic style arrow. I need to find a way to display my Mesolithic axe. Oh, without destroying everything. So that's what I'm trying to work out at the minute, how to display these weapons and where to display them. Do I put them behind my computer? Or do I put them on this wall? I don't know. I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. Do you have the cojones to debate Hancock and never drop the spoon? I don't know if I would uh, debate Graham Hancock. I don't know what the point would be. Because being good at debating and being right <laughs> are not the same. If I lost the debate, it wouldn't prove his ideas right. So... I don't know what would be would be gained from that. I would I would be interested to sit down with him 
ask him some questions, smoke a bowl, probe some, uh, you know, push back on some of his ideas a little bit, um, see what he had to say about my criticisms. But I wouldn't want to do it in a debate format. Nothing would be gained from that confrontational approach. So I'm, I'm going to say no on that one. What are your thoughts on the suggestion that the taxonomy of hominids need entirely rethinking, taking all of the fossil finds and looking at them with a fresh perspective? I have never uh, heard anyone suggest that idea before. Um, I kind of feel like that is always in a process of happening. The idea that we could get all of the fossils and, and assess them at one time is kind of hard. They're all at, at a huge variety of institutions across you know national boundaries the amount of coordination it would take to reassess absolutely everything in like a single study would be huge but i do i do kind of feel like these things are always in the process of, of being reassessed even finds like the australopithecines that we've known about for decades are, are always being discussed if there's anything that's going to totally revolutionize our view and prompt like major rewriting of stuff it is probably genetics if as we get better at studying genetics that might really overturn some uh, preconceptions but as far as i'm aware i don't believe that the whole tree needs to be reorganized all right canubis it's probably loud as hell where i am right now but i'm sorry dream sandwich i'm gonna divide this up into different categories if i'm making a sandwich at home best sandwich you can make in five minutes is a bacon and fried egg with brown sauce. In my house, that's called an Auntie Mary, because Auntie Mary used to make them for my dad when he was a kid. Shout out to Auntie Mary, shout out to dad. It's the best sandwich you can make in five minutes, no question. If I'm eating out, my taste changed, but right now what I'm craving is a Pleskovica, man. Pleskovica is so good. For those that don't know, it's a Serbian style burger. Everyone from Croatia and Bosnia is now gonna hop in the comments like, fuck you, it's not from Serbia. But I'm Stefan Milo Savlovic, okay? I've gotta, I've gotta represent the Serbs. Yeah, Serbian style burger, it's absolutely massive. You can get it with so many toppings. Like, I like cabbage, sour cream, Ivar, which is this like spicy pepper spread that they have down in the Balkans. The onions, the luke, man, it's so good. When I was in, I used to live in Belgrade. I used to go to this place in Banova Burdo all the time where I lived. Awesome, man. If you live in Portland, you can get a Pleskovica. Head on over to Two Brothers Rakia, and uh, yeah, man, they'll make you a Pleskovica. It's the freaking bomb, and it's so big. Sadly, they were closed today, so I can't film it and show you, which, is my, which was my intention. So I'm going to throw you off with a wild card choice. Check this out. It's tacos. Tacos is my wild card choice. And I know you're thinking, Stefan, you wanker. Tacos are not a sandwich. I know they're not a sandwich. But growing up in England, I had no access to Mexican food. And it's so good. It's so delicious. And realistically, a taco and a sandwich, they're fulfilling the same role in the diet. It's bread delivering some tasty treats, and I love it, I love it. But ultimately, first and foremost, big shout out to Serbia, big shout out to Pleska Vica. How do, so how does YouTube work for me financially? That's a good question, I don't mind talking about it. So the minute the videos pay for my share of the bills, I'm a married man, so. Uh, me and my wife split like our household expenditures between our two jobs and I can cover my share of that with these videos. I don't save any money at the minute, at least not in any significant way. And that's basically because I'm still reinvesting everything into the channel, into different equipment, into artwork mainly as my biggest expense, but also uh, people helping with the writing of the videos. But, it, but it's mainly artwork. I'm going to continue to do that. I don't want to make my videos without them because the quality of the videos with them is, is just a big improvement. There's no stock footage I can get of hominins a million years ago. There's no stock footage I can get really of, of life in the Bronze Age, all these things. So it's important to me to uh, have the artwork. That being said, if all of my videos were as popular as like uh, 
the Homo erectus one or you know the Homo naledi one. You guys really seem to enjoy the human evolution topics. There's a plane, but I'm just going to keep talking. Then I would be I would be set. It is kind of like a snowball a YouTube channel because I make money off a, a new release but all the old releases are still slowly ticking away in the background but the the viewership does drop significantly after the first like few days of a video really most of the time it seems that people like longer videos i don't know if that's true or if the algorithm just pushes them more um, but it seems like you guys like the longer videos around 20 to 30 minutes so that is sort of a goal that i have to make videos that are around that length um, but I don't want to force the story, you know, if the story is a short story, let's just make it a, a short story. No need to labor the point. And uh, what was I going to say? I think the biggest obstacle for me financially and in terms of the channel is having a production window. I, I know my Patreons, I've talked to them about this before. That's my biggest obstacle because at the minute all the work is a little bit rushed and um, I'm having to work on several projects at the same time just to try and maintain a consistent schedule, which is confusing for my brain. It like legit hurts my brain to have all these things flying in the air all the time, all these, all these pots that I'm juggling or, or whatever the expression is. Having a production window moving forward would be a fantastic thing. That's what videos like this are for. I'm gonna record this today. I'm recording this today on the 1st of June. I don't know when I'll release it to you because maybe I'll just take a couple of weeks to give me that production window. I once saw a video from uh, Mark Roper, Roba, Mark Roper, I think. He said he has all his videos planned out a year in advance. When you have that kind of amount of time to work on a project, the quality can improve exponentially, in my opinion. So I'm trying to work to the point where I can get a month or two ahead have videos already scheduled to be released and uh, and then with like a two month production window ideally I'm hoping the quality will improve the viewership will improve the consistency will improve all of that and when all of that falls into place then financially I'll be set but until then I really appreciate all you guys support on patreon but that's that's what I'm focusing on I'm focusing on the quality and then the finances will fall into place. YouTube, the YouTube algorithm wants me to be successful. It wants me to be successful and it wants you guys to watch the videos because that's just an opportunity for them to make ad revenue. Yeah, focus on the quality, tell bigger stories, try and get that production window sorted out. And, and then, yeah. When am I gonna start a podcast? That's a great question. I think about it all the time. I have an idea for a podcast format. All ready to go but at the minute whilst I don't have that production uh, cushion that I want it's kind of hard to get organized I don't, and I want to really hit the ground running with it you know I want a couple of co-hosts ideally I'd want them to be in Portland Oregon because that's where I am and I think that the dynamic works so much better when you're in the same room um, I want it recorded because I think people find most podcasts through video, through clips and things like that. So I would need a podcast editor because I don't have the time to do that. Maybe by the end of the year, maybe by next year, there'll be something. Who knows? Who knows? When are you and those plastic skulls going to shut up and kiss? Histocrat. God damn you. I made a short film for <laughs> this scenario. And it's just too terrible. It's just too terrible. But I'll give you a line from it. But it's too terrible. I can't actually show the film. I can't. I'm married. Oh, okay. What is this life? It's a crazy life. <laughs> it's too bad. Maybe I'll post it on Instagram. I don't know. These two are kind of linked. What's the single most thing, in your opinion, that discredits Graham Hancock? The many followers of his overlook and do you think it's possible that sedentary agricultural civilization may have de developed multiple times in history or a pre-human history i suppose so to answer the first they're sort of connected because the biggest objection i have is that it's in the crops man it's the crops if agriculture was a result of Atlantis, then how come crops are geographically isolated for the majority of human history? 
corn, tomatoes, potatoes in the new world, wheat, rice, things like that in the old world. Why is there that divide if this civilization could span the continents? Because we can't say that, oh, they developed potatoes in the Americas because they grew better there and wheat grew better in Europe. Because we know we can grow these things anywhere. We do it now. Our entire civilization depends on us doing it now. So it can't be that. So these people just must have been isolated. They must have been restricted to their respective regions for the most part. That and the fact that, you know, how many human genomes have been fully analyzed now, several million, through ancestry and all these things. Literally, we're talking in the millions of human genomes that have been analyzed now, and we don't have evidence for this large-scale admixture. I, I believe in our ability to love eating potatoes, and our, I believe in our ability to want to shag our neighbors. Those two things, you could you could put them on my grave. I believe in those. Now, do I think it was possible? <sighs> Anything's possible, really. I can't really say that it wasn't possible. But the climate would have been really hard. I mean, humans evolved 300,000 years ago. We don't have any evidence of modern human behavior, like art and stuff like that. We don't really start to see that emerge until 100,000 years ago. So if you're not going to throw out the entirety of our evolutionary tree, then we're only talking the last 100,000 years. And in that time period, the climate was extremely cold and extremely variable. Large areas of Europe were under glaciers. Large areas of the northern hemisphere were way colder than they are now. Vast areas of tundra. So... These, if they were farming, they were only farming in the tropics, for sure. And we just don't see evidence of it. We just don't, we just don't see any evidence of it. So I don't actually think it was possible. Anything's possible, but also I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Will humans evolve into different species if we master interstellar travel and get separated on distant planets? Absolutely. Evolution is inevitable. We can't even help it. We're doing it all the time. And if two human populations get isolated, then they'll eventually despeciate. The only thing that prevents despeciation is shagging, continual shagging. If we stop the shagging, despeciation. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks so much to my patrons. You're all a massive bunch of legends. What can I say? What can I say? I'm just on my way to film the intro to this 100,000 subscriber video when I got recognized in public. Crazy, crazy. I'm gonna see if the guy who recognized me wants to do the outro. All right, he said yes. Let's get the camera. Thank you everybody for watching. Please comment, like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much to the Patreon supporters. Couldn't do it without you. <laughs> Please listen to Left on 10th. Woo! Left on 10th. That's the band. He said subscribe to my YouTube channel. I think he meant my YouTube channel. Yes, yes. <laughs>